Hello. Welcome to my course on the importance of emotion in ADHD. I'm Dr. Russell Barkley and I'm a clinical professor of psychiatry at the Medical University of South Carolina. Before I begin, let me disclose to you my sources of support for the previous year so that you can evaluate whether there is any potential conflict of interest with the contents of this presentation. I'm retired from the University of Massachusetts Medical School, for which I receive a pension, but I'm obviously not retired. I've spoken for a number of healthcare organizations and professional associations during the previous 12 months, and you can see many of them listed here. I also receive royalties for various products I have created, such as books, videos, newsletters, and courses such as this one. Finally, I do consult with and speak for many of the major pharmaceutical companies that have ADHD products in the marketplace. This presentation is about the importance of emotion in ADHD. There are several objectives of this course. First, I will briefly review the nature of emotion and emotional self-regulation. Then I will show the seven lines of evidence I believe that support the importance of a central role of emotional impulsiveness and deficient emotional self-control in ADHD. I will also summarize the research on the impact of emotion regulation problems in ADHD on various domains of major life activities in children followed to adulthood and in adults with ADHD. And then finally, I will discuss the implications of these findings for diagnosis and treatment of ADHD. The current clinical view of ADHD, as reflected in the DSM criteria, is that ADHD is a developmentally inappropriate expression of symptoms in at least two neuropsychological dimensions of development. That is to say that ADHD is a delay in the rate of development of these two dimensions. The first dimension is that of inattention. It is here that we see the individual having difficulties with sustained attention or more accurately with persistence toward goals, tasks, and the future more generally. Along with this difficulty with persistence, there is also a problem with impaired resistance to responding to distractions, giving rise to the distractibility often seen in patients with ADHD. When patients with ADHD are distracted, they often have much greater difficulties with re-engaging the incompleted goal or task. Instead, they will skip from one incompleted activity to another, often forgetting what the previous task or goal was that they were working on if they have been distracted. This problem with difficulties re-engaging a goal is a function of impaired working memory, not of inattention. Working memory is an executive capacity that allows us to remember what it is that we are doing and how we propose to get there. Individuals with ADHD have considerable problems with this type of working memory. Now the second domain that is not developing in ADHD is that of inhibition. This gives rise to the impulsiveness and the hyperactivity seen in ADHD. The problems with inhibition are pervasive. They are seen in verbal behavior, in motor behavior, in cognitive impulsiveness such as in impulsive decision making and difficulties with deferred gratification in devaluing future consequences over immediate ones more than do others. And this also gives rise to the excessive task irrelevant movement and the excessive verbal behavior, in other words, the hyperactivity seen in ADHD. This hyperactivity is often manifested in the early childhood years by excessive fidgeting, squirming, running about, or climbing on things, and so forth but it declines markedly with age such that by adulthood it is not very apparent and patients with the disorder often express it as being more of an internal or subjective feeling of restlessness or a need to feel busy. Now where does emotion fit into this two-dimensional view of ADHD? Before we discuss this issue it will help to define what we mean by emotions and by emotional self-regulation, and then we can see where 
ADHD might be causing difficulties in these two concepts. An emotion can be defined as a short-term change, that is a short duration change, in one's intentions to act. Usually emotions are provoked by situational events, and these provocations alter the intentions of the organism as to how it will respond to that event. These changes are reflected in alterations in behavior, cognition, subjective experience, degree of arousal, and in motivation. Emotions are short-term changes as compared to moods. Moods are often cross-situational and of a much longer duration than are emotions. And so we are speaking here specifically about emotions, that is, these short duration changes in one's reactions to situational events. Now, emotions can be plotted along a three-dimensional grid. That is to say, emotions comprise three different elements. There is the action or behavioral gradient in which the organism either approaches or withdraws from the provocative event. In other words, does the organism see this event as an opportunity or as a threat? The second dimension along which emotions can be plotted is a motivational gradient, and this reflects the reinforcement or punishment aspects of the event. In other words, does the individual desire this event and prefer to approach it, or does it fear the event or find it frustrating and attempt to withdraw from it? The third dimension is that of a biological dimension, uh, often referred to as the intensity of the emotion, and this is degree, the degree of physiological arousal or activation provoked by the environmental event. Now, emotions serve a variety of functions for organisms, including humans. One of these is that emotions apparently serve a corrective function. That is, when an organism is pursuing a particular goal, and that goal is frustrated, or the individual becomes off task, or is not pursuing the goal as quickly as they should, then emotions are often elicited, and this helps to the individual to correct their behavior back toward the path of goal direction. So there is a l feedback loop, or corrective function, that emotions appear to serve. Emotions will be provoked when goals are being frustrated or thwar thwarted, in this case, there will be negative emotions. On the other hand, when the goal is being pursued and the pace of that pursuit is more rapid, the individual will find themselves experiencing positive moods. Now, besides serving a corrective function for goal-directed behavior, emotions are also communicative to others. They signal our intentions as to what we propose to do next. And finally, of course, emotions are expressive or cathartic in nature, helping to release the degree of physiological arousal, allowing the individual to eventually habituate to the provoked emotion. Now we can define what we mean by emotional self-regulation. We can think of emotions and emotional control as a two-part process. There is the primary emotion, which I've just discussed, that is provoked by a situational event, and then there is the second stage, which is the active attempt to regulate the emotion in some way. This is an effortful, top-down, executive aspect of emotional self-control, where the individual is attempting to come to grips with the emotion, so to speak, and moderate it so that it is more consistent with the individual's goals. In this second stage, which is emotional self-control, the individual attempts to inhibit the strong emotion that has been provoked by the situation, and then attempts to self-soothe or calm themselves down, or in other ways down-regulate the physiological arousal that has been provoked by the primary emotion. They may also attempt to refocus their attention away from the emotionally provocative event using distraction, reappraisal, or other methods in order to further downregulate or moderate the primary emotion. And then the individual will attempt to organize a new emotion or a more moderate emotion and use more coordinated action 
in the service of their goals and for their long-term welfare. In other words, the individual attempts to bring the emotion in line with their goals and longer-term welfare and to make it more socially acceptable. So again, we can see that emotion and emotional self-control comprise two stages. Emotions are the primary emotions provoked by situations, and emotional self-control is what we do afterwards in an effort to moderate the expression of the emotion so that it is more acceptable and consistent with our goals and long-term welfare. Now, the most commonly accepted model for emotion in the literature is that of J.J. Gross. Gross's process model of emotion says that all emotions proceed through a four-stage process. You see the stages represented here on the slide. And although these stages can occur within a matter of seconds or even milliseconds, it is helpful to distinguish the four stages that appear to be involved in the emotion. The first stage is that of the situation itself, and that is to say the event that is provoking the emotion. The second stage is that we attend to this provocative event. Following this direction of our attention networks to the event, there is a brief moment of appraisal of the event for its threat or desirability, that is to say, for its approach avoidance nature. Does the individual appraise the event as positive, desirable, or reinforcing, and therefore approach it? Or do they appraise the event as punitive or aversive, and then uh, seek to withdraw from the event? Finally, there is the response to the event itself, which may involve the emotion and the physiological arousal uh, that has been initiated by the appraisal stage. Now, as I've said, these four stages can occur in rapid succession and may not always be delineated by the individual. But as Gross has pointed out, it is still helpful to separate the emotion into these four stages. Now, when we think about emotional self-control, as I've said, we think about it as a two-stage process. There is the automatic level of emotion, which we have just described using Gross's model of uh, emotional uh, expression. We can understand the second stage, which is the emotional self-control stage, by showing a diagram of an emotion and what humans are likely to do to control that emotion. Now here we see along the bottom axis, time, and along the left-hand axis, is going to be the intensity or valence of the emotion. And the intensity and its valence can be positive or it can be negative, as in the case of aversive or unpleasant emotions. Now, we've just described the four stages that an emotion goes through when it is provoked by a situational event. And we can call this the primary emotion, so that when an event occurs, an individual has this primary emotional reaction to it. This is an automatic emotion. It is not, not part of self-regulation. But when humans experience these primary emotions, they will engage in a second stage of emotional self-regulation. And this stage is seen here as that of a secondary emotional self-regulation. And as part of this stage, the individual may attempt to down-regulate the emotion, as I've said, through self-calming, distraction, reappraisal, or leaving the situation, or in other ways, down-regulate it. The individual, on the other hand, may decide to prolong or enhance the emotion. This is more likely to occur if the emotion is positive rather than negative. But there may be times where it is in the service of an individual's goals to enhance or prolong the primary emotion that has been provoked by the situation. Finally, humans are able to create another emotion that may countermand or contradict the initial emotion and therefore help to bring the initial primary emotion back under control more quickly. For instance, when an individual is frustrated or angered as their primary emotion in response to an event,
they may elect to count to ten, visualize a very relaxing situation such as lying on a beach somewhere for instance and this visual imagery creates a second emotion and that second emotion competes with and helps to downregulate the initial emotion. And so humans have a variety of means by which they may try to self-regulate the primary emotion. Now if ADHD involves a difficulty with emotional self-regulation, what would we expect to see in ADHD as a consequence of this difficulty? First, we would expect to see impulsive emotion. The individual would display their primary emotions much more quickly and find them much more difficult to inhibit them, and therefore they would be expressed in a stronger uh, capacity. That is, the nature of the emotion would be more raw and unmoderated relative to what we would see in under, other individuals of the same developmental level. And while we would see them having difficulties with expressing all emotions, that is, they would be impulsive in expressing both po positive and negative emotions, it is the negative emotions that we would see having the greatest difficulties for them. And that is because in a group living species such as ourselves, it is the negative emotions that have the greatest social costs on our social relationships more than the impulsive expression of positive emotions such as humor or affection. That is to say that it is the negative emotions that, in, that are less forgiving in a social group than are the positive emotions. So we would expect to see a greater expression of emotional excitability, greater expression of arousal, uh, in all emotionally provocative situations. But the emotions that are going to pose the greatest difficulties for people with ADHD are the negative ones, which are those of frustration, impatience, anger, and hostility, because these are the most socially costly emotions to express. Now we will also see difficulties in the second stage of emotional self-control, which is the attempt to self-regulate the primary emotion. People with ADHD will be more deficient in this ability to engage in top-down regulation of the emotion in order to make it more consistent with the situation, with their goals, and with their long-term welfare. So people with ADHD will find it harder to self-calm and self-soothe. They will find it more difficult to refocus their attention and distract themselves away from the provocative situation. They will also find it more difficult to leave the situation if necessary as a tactic for downregulating the emotion. And they will find it harder to reappraise the situation in order to further downregulate the emotion. We would also see them having difficulties with inducing positive emotions to counterman the initial primary negative emotion and make it more acceptable to the situation. And because, as I've said, emotions are motivational states, people with ADHD will find it more difficult to self-motivate and to self-regulate their arousal and activation to situations than will other individuals. Now we're going to examine whether or not ADHD does involve a difficulty with emotional impulsiveness and with deficient emotional self-regulation. I will use the acronyms EI for emotional impulsiveness and DESR for the second stage of deficient emotional self-regulation throughout the rest of these, this presentation. Now why should we make these two components of deficient emotional control a central feature of ADHD? And if we did so, where would it fit in? I'm going to present seven lines of evidence that I believe support the inclusion of emotional dysregulation as a central feature of ADHD along with its other two components, that is those of inhibition problems and those of attention and executive difficulties. These seven lines of evidence include the history of ADHD, the neuroanatomy of ADHD, neuropsychological models that have been developed on ADHD,
the psychological evidence of itself for impulsive emotion in studies of children and adults with ADHD. I'm also going to present evidence on why, if emotion is part of ADHD, it would help to better understand comorbid disorders with ADHD, such as oppositional defiant disorder, which is the most common comorbidity seen with ADHD. I'm also going to show that by including emotion back in ADHD, we are better able to predict many of the impairments in major life activities that individuals with ADHD are likely to have across the lifespan, and that this prediction will be in addition to what is predicted by the difficulties in attention and in inhibition. I'm also going to show how including emotion in ADHD helps to clarify the diagnosis of ADHD and also what the implications of including emotion in ADHD are for its clinical management. Let me begin with the evidence from the history of ADHD. ADHD was first documented in the medical literature in 1798 by the physician Alexander Crichton. In his medical textbook, Crichton includes a chapter on diseases of attention, and in that chapter he describes the two major attention disorders that we currently recognize, that of ADHD, which is characterized by short attention span, lack of persistence, distractibility, and of course the uh, impulsiveness that I've already mentioned. And the second disorder still recognized is that of the more daydreamy, spacey, easily confused and mentally foggy individual, which researchers now refer to as sluggish cognitive tempo, and clinicians sometimes diagnose as ADD, or attention deficit disorder, or as the inattentive type of ADHD. No matter, it is Crichton that first described ADHD, though he didn't use that name for the disorder. And in his description, particularly of the distractible, impersistent form of attention disorder, he included the fact that these individuals often had difficulties with emotional frustration. In 1902, George Still described a syndrome like ADHD, which he referred to as defective moral regulation of behavior or poor moral control. And in describing individuals who were quite hyperactive, impulsive, distractible, and inattentive, he included as a primary feature of this disorder emotional impulsiveness and difficulties with regulating emotion, still referred to these individuals as being very passionate, and by passionate he did not mean loving, he meant that they had difficulties with uh, controlling their emotions and were likely to express their emotions to a greater degree and more intensively than would other individuals. After the two world wars, attention began to return back to doing studies of mental disorders. And in the 1950s and 60s, the disorder that we now call ADHD was being described as brain injured child syndrome, or minimal brain damage, or later, minimal brain dysfunction. Finally, it would be renamed as the hyperactive child syndrome, or as hyperkinesis. Clinicians that were evaluating individuals that had MBD or hyperactivity described deficient emotional self-regulation as a central feature in these disorders. In the 1970s, Mark Stewart also included low frustration tolerance, quickness to anger, and emotional excitability as primary features in his description of the hyperactive child syndrome. In 1975, Dennis Cantwell also included emotional dysregulation as a core feature in his description of the hyperactive child syndrome, or hyperkinesis. Also in the 1970s, Paul Wender also included difficulties with emotional self-regulation and impulsive expression of emotions as a key feature in his description of minimal brain dysfunction in children and adults. In fact, it is Wender who is credited with being among the first to describe
the nature of adult MBD, or what now would be called adult ADHD, and in it, emotion was considered to be a primary clinical finding in the disorder, that is to say, a central feature of it. So why is emotion no longer included in ADHD? Why isn't it part of the DSM criteria? We have to go back to 1968 when DSM-2 was first published to understand what may have happened because it is in the publication of this manual and its brief diagnostic criteria for the hyperkinetic reaction of childhood or what is now ADHD that we see that emotion was neglected. DSM-2 describes ADHD or hyperkinesis as involving three central features inattentiveness with distractibility, the second feature is impulsiveness, and the third is hyperactivity. There is no mention made of emotion, even though at the time and throughout its entire history, hyperkinesis or hyperactivity has always included poor emotion self-regulation, as I have said. Now, I've attempted to research why emotion was ignored in DSM-2 but I'm not able to find any compelling reason for it. Perhaps it is because this is the beginnings of the scientific study of child psychiatric disorders, and doing observational studies of mental disorders was becoming increasingly important. And it is easy to measure symptoms of distractibility, inattentiveness, and impulsiveness, not to mention hyperactivity but it is much more difficult to measure symptoms of emotional dysregulation. So perhaps it is this measurement issue that led to the neglect of emotion in DSM-2. Another reason might be that Stella Chess had earlier published a paper in which she described the hyperactive child syndrome as being comprised solely of excessive motor activity. And Stella Chess, being a major child psychiatrist at the time, a very influential one, may have had some influence over the wording of the criteria for ADHD in DSM-2. I'm not sure of that, but it's one possibility. Nevertheless, it is at this juncture that we see emotion being relegated to a secondary or unimportant status in our conceptualization of ADHD. And once emotion was neglected in the official taxonomy of ADHD, it has been neglected ever since, all the way through DSM-4. Now, besides the history of ADHD supporting the inclusion of emotional dysregulation as a central feature of the disorder, emotional dysregulation should also be found to be a part of ADHD because of the neuroanatomy of the disorder. Evidence on neuroanatomical findings for ADHD would support the role of emo emotion dysregulation in the disorder. Let's have a look at the findings that have been found in, num in a number of studies on the neuroanatomy of ADHD. Studies both of the structure of the brain and of the functioning of the brain in ADHD indicate that there are five domains or five regions in the brain that are not developing properly in people with this disorder. These brain regions are about 3 to 10 percent smaller in their structure and they are about 10 to 25 percent less active in their functioning. These regions are the orbital prefrontal cortex, particularly in the right frontal lobe. We know that this part of the brain is underdeveloped in ADHD, and it suggests that the right side of the brain may be more involved in ADHD than the left side of the brain. The second structure is the basal ganglia at the central part of the brain, and principally the striatum. This area is also smaller in individuals with ADHD. The third area is the cerebellum, as you see here. The cerebellum is an ancient brain structure at the back part of the brain, and it is also smaller in people with ADHD, particularly in the central area known as the vermis. Once again, we see the right side of the brain being more underdeveloped in individuals with ADHD 
than the left side of the brain, though findings do indicate underdevelopment of both brain hemispheres. Yet it is principally more on the right than the left. Next we see that the anterior cingulate of the brain is less developed and less active. This is a structure at the midline of the frontal cortex and it is involved in a number of aspects of conflict resolution. Finally, we see that the corpus callosum is involved in ADHD. The corpus callosum is the large bundle of fibers that connects to two hemispheres and allows the left and right hemisphere to communicate with each other. The size of these structures and the networks that they create are directly correlated with the severity of ADHD symptoms, particularly that of inhibition. There are very few gender differences seen in ADHD studies, and what little there are are not important for this particular topic or presentation. Longitudinal studies, such as that by Philip Shaw, indicate that there is about a two to three year lag in the development of these brain structures, but that the structure of the brain may start to normalize by mid to late adolescence. Nevertheless, despite this apparent normalizing of brain structure, there appears to be uh, a much greater lag in the development of brain activation. That is to say, differences in brain activity continue to be found in these brain structures well into adulthood, even if the size of the brain may lo no longer be a distinguishing feature of the disorder. And finally, contrary to accusations made by critics, the underdevelopment and underfunctioning of these brain regions is not the result of giving stimulant medication for the management of ADHD. These same findings have been evident in stimulant naive individuals, that is to say those who have never been treated with medication. Now let me show you where these brain areas are located in this diagram of the human brain. The frontal lobe of the human brain is this large structure we see here at the anterior part of the brain and the area we are most concerned about within the prefrontal cortex is the orbital prefrontal region that you see right here. This is the area directly behind the forehead and especially that brain region sitting just over the eye orbits. It is principally in this right area that we see much less development of brain size and functioning. Now the second area of interest is that of the basal ganglia and that is located here, this reddish orange structure. Nerve cells from the cortex project back and terminate on the striatum in particular and the nerve cells from the frontal lobe terminate at the anterior part of the striatum which is known as the caudate nucleus. Now in addition to the basal ganglia being smaller in people with ADHD, the cerebellum is also involved in ADHD as you see here at the back part of the brain and it is the central area here known as the vermis that is typically found to be smaller and less active in individuals with ADHD. The fourth structure involved in ADHD is the anterior cingulate and to find the anterior cingulate we have to go into this fissure between the two hemispheres and if we progress back several inches right about where you see this arrow and look on the left or the right walls of the hemispheres we will see the anterior cingulate. This is also smaller and less active in people with ADHD. Finally, although not shown in this diagram, the corpus callosum which is located around in here and allows the two hemispheres of the brain to communicate with each other as I've said is also smaller, particularly in the frontal part of the corpus callosum known as the splenium. Now this is another way of viewing the human brain and here we've cut the brain in half and we're now looking directly at the right hemisphere of the brain. And here we can see some of these same brain structures more clearly. First of all we see the dorsolateral frontal lobe, in particular its orbital aspect over here. This is smaller in ADHD as I've already said. The anterior cingulate, which was difficult to visualize in the previous slide, is located here at the medial or middle aspect 
of the frontal lobe. And here we see the right anterior cingulate. Now, in addition, we also see the remaining, remaining part of the brain that is involved in the top-down regulation of behavior. And I'll have more to say about that in just a moment, because the ability to regulate emotions brings into play other parts of the brain and not just the frontal lobe, which we see up here. Now, as I've said, the cerebellum is involved in ADHD, and that's back here, and we're mainly looking at the central aspect of the cerebellum, or the vermis, which is right here. Now, on this diagram, we can see that the frontal lobe is able to regulate the limbic system, which is the emotional brain that you see here, and it does so through the amygdala. Projections go from the dorsolateral aspect of the frontal lobe into the anterior cingulate, and from the anterior cingulate to the amygdala. And from here, the frontal lobe is able to regulate the expression of our emotions. And therefore, if ADHD is a disorder that involves these neuroanatomical regions, then ADHD should also involve a problem with the top-down regulation of primary emotions. We would also expect to see that ADHD would involve a problem with self-awareness, and particularly with the self-awareness of one's primary emotional states. This diagram shows where self-awareness can be localized in the human brain. Most importantly, it shows that the anterior cingulate, or the midline of the frontal lobe, is critically involved in self-awareness, and that the anterior cingulate is also interconnected with other aspects of the brain that allow us to possess self-awareness and to engage in self-monitoring. Now, as I've said, the anterior cingulate is underdeveloped and underfunctioning in ADHD, and this would create a problem with self-awareness in ADHD, and it would also create a problem, therefore, with the self-awareness of one's emotions, as you see here. So the neuroanatomy of ADHD indicates that there ought to be a problem with emotional control and self-regulation, given that the same brain regions that are involved in emotional self-regulation are also the brain regions that are involved in ADHD. There would have to be a problem with emotion in ADHD if this is the case. Now this diagram shows the interconnection between the anterior cingulate located here and the amygdala located here. And we know that the amygdala and the remaining part of the, the limbic system located back in this brain region, that these structures have reciprocal networks with the anterior cingulate. And therefore, if individuals with ADHD have an impairment in the development of the anterior cingulate, there will be difficulties in regulating the primary emotional brain, which is the amygdala and limbic system. So again, this is just another way of showing that emotional dysregulation has to be involved in ADHD if the frontal lobe and anterior cingulate are involved in ADHD, which they clearly are. Now another reason to include impulsive emotion and deficient emotional self-control in ADHD has to do with current neuropsychological theories of the disorder. All of these theories include an emotional component in the disorder even if it isn't reflected in the formal diagnostic criteria for ADHD in the DSM. Various theorists that have reviewed the neuropsychological evidence and the neuroanatomy of ADHD have argued that there are three networks that can be formed out of the five brain structures that we have discussed as being involved in ADHD. One of these networks is the connections from the dorsolateral aspect of the frontal lobe back into the basal ganglia and specifically to the striatum, as I showed you earlier. This is known as the cool executive network or the what network. It is here that what an individual is holding in mind in their working memory, for instance, 
is going to regulate what they do. In other words, our thoughts or what we hold in mind are going to organize and enact behavior in support of our thoughts. This is why it is called the what network. In short, what we hold in mind is going to manage what we do. Now the second network that can be formed out of these brain structures are the connections from the frontal lobe back into the cerebellum. This frontal cerebellar circuit has been called the WHEN network because this circuit is involved in the timing and timeliness of our actions as well as of our thoughts. The cerebellum is not just involved in the smoothness of motor action and in coordination and rapid sequencing of action. It is also involved in the timing of human action. And the cerebellum is just as much involved in these aspects of behavior as they may occur in thinking as they are in the actual expression of the behavior itself. In other words, the cerebellum is instrumental in higher cortical or higher cognitive activity just as much as it is in behavioral expression. So it is here that the timing of thoughts and actions is being regulated by the executive circuitry. Finally, there is the emotional circuit, the hot circuit, or what is called the Y executive network. This is the connections from the frontal lobe through the anterior cingulate to the amygdala and the limbic system more generally. It is through this circuit, as I pointed out earlier, that what we think is going to affect how we feel. This creates not just an emotional circuit, but an appraisal network, because it is here that one appraises the value of what one is thinking about. In other words, it is here that feelings are connected to thoughts. And so when we hold an idea in mind, that idea comes with a certain emotional coloring. And that coloring is provided by this particular frontal limbic circuit. And it helps us to quickly evaluate the worth of an idea, that is, whether or not it is worthwhile pursuing this idea or not. And that is because, as Damasio pointed out, our feelings are welded to our thoughts as a function of this network. And that is why it is called the HOT or the Y executive circuit. Here you see the various papers by various theorists that have argued for these three networks being involved in ADHD. And one of these networks is clearly the network that regulates emotion. And so the neuropsychology of ADHD would indicate that emotion has to be a primary part of the disorder in addition to the difficulties we see with attention and working memory that occur in the cool executive network here and with the difficulties with the timing and timeliness of behavior that would arise from the timing circuit that you see here. Now, besides these particular theories of ADHD, my own theory of ADHD and of executive functioning would also argue for the inclusion of emotion in ADHD. My theory argues that there are six executive functions that develop in individuals. These are self-awareness, inhibition, nonverbal and verbal working memory, inhibition, particularly of emotions, and self-regulation of those emotions, and planning and problem solving. I have argued that each of these executive functions is a form of action directed at oneself, that is a form of self-control. Individuals direct their attention back on themselves to create self-awareness. They direct their primary inhibitory ability back on themselves to create self-restraint. They also redirect their senses back at themselves, particularly vision, to create visual imagery, and this creates the nonverbal working memory system. They also redirect their speech at themselves and develop a voice in the mind, and this forms the verbal working memory system. Then they use these four executive functions 
to create emotional self-regulation in themselves. That is, by talking to themselves and by visualizing images, individuals are able to provoke secondary emotions in order to help regulate their primary emo emotions. It is also here, of course, where emotion creates self-motivation in individuals. As I've said previously, emotions are motivations, and therefore, if one is able to regulate their emotions, they are also able to self-regulate their motivational states. And finally, in my theory of executive functioning, planning and problem solving is seen as a form of play to the self, in which children's play has become progressively internalized or privatized over development to facilitate mental planning and problem solving, which in my model is simply the ability to manipulate what one is holding in mind and to play with the contents of working memory in order to discover novel recombinations of that information and develop novel ways of responding to the environment, hence of problem solving. So even in my theory of ADHD and of executive functioning, emotion and emotional dysregulation has to be a central feature of the disorder. Now besides the neuropsychological theories of ADHD, including emotion in the components of ADHD, the psychological evidence also supports the inclusion of emotion in ADHD. What do we find when we go out and observe individuals' behavior, uh, that is, their ADHD behavior, in natural settings? Recently, I have developed a rating scale of executive functioning in daily life activities, and we have applied this to individuals with ADHD. This rating scale has found that there are five dimensions of executive functioning in daily life, and you see them here, self-management to time, self-organization and problem solving, self-restraint or inhibition, self-motivation, and most importantly, as you see at the bottom of the slide, the self-regulation of emotion here. So when we evaluate children and adults with ADHD, we see that they have great difficulty with all of these executive functions in daily life activities, or what I call executive behavior. And among these five problems, they have significant difficulties with emotional self-control. So research clearly shows that the inclusion of emotional problems in ADHD is not hypothetical, but real. There is evidence from these rating scales and observations of daily behavior that emotion has to be a part of this disorder, and certainly is. Now other evidence can be marshaled to show that emotional dysregulation is part of ADHD. Other studies, such as those using the Child Behavior Checklist, the Behavioral Assessment System for Children, the Symptom Checklist 90 with adults, and other behavior rating scales indicate significant elevations on subscales that reflect problems with emotional regulation, such as with low frustration tolerance, impatience, anger, and overall emotional excitability. So that there is evidence from other rating scales besides my own to show that emotion is a problem for those with ADHD. There have also been studies that have brought individuals with ADHD into the lab and have videotaped their emotional expressions during emotionally provocative situations. And what these studies show is that people with ADHD express their emotions more impulsively, that is, they have poor inhibition of their primary emotions, especially of impatience, low frustration tolerance, and anger and hostility. These studies also indicate that when people with ADHD are instructed to try to control these emotions as well as they can, that compared to control groups, they are far less able to engage in self-regulation of these emotional states. Most recently, research shows that even at the level of the autonomic nervous system, there are differences in the capacity of individuals with ADHD to regulate this emotion-related nervous system. These studies indicate that people with ADHD have a more flattened or suppressed profile in the parasympathetic nervous system in response to emotional provocative events. Normally, in individuals, this 
system is increased in its activity during emotional expression and that it is decreased in activity when individuals attempt to self-regulate their emotions. These studies indicate that there is abnormal regulation in brain regions that govern, govern the parasympathetic nervous system in people with ADHD and these problems with emotional dysregulation are evident even at the physiological level of emotional expression. Now follow-up studies such as my own in Milwaukee of ADHD children followed to adulthood indicate that the majority of them have difficulties with impulsive emotion and deficient emotional self-regulation, particularly as a function of whether or not their ADHD has persisted. Also, studies I have done on adults with ADHD who are clinic referred in adulthood indicate that these adults also have problems with emotional impulsiveness and deficient emotional self-control. Now here are the results from the Milwaukee study that I have just mentioned. As you can see along the bottom of the graph here, we have graphed the frequency with which these individuals describe themselves as often having difficulties with these emotions. There were others that we recorded in the study, but I'll just show you these five to make the point and also so that the graph can be interpreted more clearly. Now in my Milwaukee study, we have taken our groups of children at adulthood and we have separated them into those whose ADHD has persisted to age 27. That's the ADHD P group represented in the red bar that you see in the diagram. And we have divided them into those whose ADHD did not persist to age 27. Some of these individuals had recovered from their ADHD completely, while others continued to show high levels of symptoms but did not meet all diagnostic criteria for the disorder. They are represented by the light blue bar that you see in the diagram. Finally, we have been following a control group of individuals from the same neighborhoods, schools, and social classes as the ADHD individuals, and they are shown in the diagram by the yellow bar. Now what do we see here in this diagram? We see that individuals whose ADHD has persisted to adulthood have considerably more problems with controlling these emotions than do individuals whose ADHD has not persisted and compared to those in our control group. Notice that the non-persistent group of ADHD also has more difficulties regulating these emotions than the control group, but not to the degree seen in those whose ADHD that has persisted. In other words, the more an individual's ADHD is likely to have persisted to adulthood, the greater is the likelihood that they will have difficulties with regulating these emotions. That is, they will often report expressing these emotions more than do other individuals. This study also found that the frequency with which these individuals were having these difficulties was just as often as for the symptoms of inattention, impulsiveness, and hyperactivity in the official DSM criteria. So that the emotional problems of these individuals occur just as often as the traditional ADHD symptoms are likely to do in this population followed to adulthood. Now on the next slide you will see my study of clinic referred adults with ADHD done with Kevin Murphy when we were at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. Here we are see the very same emotions that were seen in the Milwaukee study graphed along the bottom of the diagram here. And we have two groups, clinic referred adults with ADHD and a community control group. And it is quite obvious here that the individuals with ADHD with the red bar here have considerably more difficulties with controlling these emotions than does our clinical control group. And that is true across all of these emotions. We also find that the frequency with which these individuals had these difficulties is just as great as for the traditional DSM symptoms reported in DSM-4. So here again, to the extent that an individual has ADHD, we will also find that they have considerable problems with 
the regulation of impulsive emotion, and particularly with the control of these negative emotions. In other words, the evidence now shows that emotional self-regulation problems are ubiquitous in people with ADHD, that is to say that they are just as common as are the other central features of ADHD, such as inattention, distractibility, hyperactivity, and impulsivity. So the psychological evidence warrants returning emotional dysregulation back into ADHD. Now another reason to include emotion as a core feature of ADHD is that it can help to understand why certain disorders are highly comorbid with ADHD. The disorder that is most comorbid with ADHD is Oppositional Defiant Disorder, or ODD. ODD occurs on average in at least 65% of ADHD individuals, ranging from 40% in some studies to over 80% in other studies. Therefore, ODD is the most common comorbidity seen in ADHD. ODD reflects a pattern of anger, hostility, defiance, stubbornness, low frustration tolerance, and particularly with resistance to authority, especially parental authority. Now, while the DSM represents ODD as a single dimension of symptoms, research has shown that ODD actually is best represented as a two-dimensional disorder, and indeed DSM-5 will correct this representation in ODD when it is eventually published in 2013. It will also show ODD as a two-dimensional disorder. Now, the two dimensions that comprise ODD are those of emotion dysregulation and social conflict. So at least three to four symptoms of ODD reflect problems with controlling these negative emotions. The temper, the hostility, and so on would be part of the emotion dysregulation dimension. And the arguing and defiance and refusal and so forth would be symptoms reflecting of the social conflict dimension of ODD. Now we know that ODD is likely to develop in ADHD 11 times more than is the case in the general population. As I've said, ODD is the most common comorbidity associated with ADHD, and when ODD develops, it often develops within two years of the onset of ADHD. By understanding ODD as a two-dimensional disorder, we can now see where ADHD contributes to ODD, and that is that ADHD is contributing to the emotional dysregulation of ODD, and that is because emotional dysregulation is an inherent part of ADHD. So that the impulsive emotion in ADHD, which arises from the hyperactive impulsive dimension of ADHD, is strongly associated with the impulsive emotion seen in ODD. This is why it is the hyperactive impulsive dimension of ADHD that predicts the development of ODD in individuals. It is also the problem with the self-control of emotion in ADHD that is associated with its inattention dimension that creates the problems that people with ADHD have in self-regulating both their emotions and their oppositional defiant disorder. So as I said before, emotional self-control is a two-part process. Inhibiting the primary emotion, which ADHD individuals have trouble doing, and self-regulating the primary emotion once it's been elicited. Both of these difficulties would contribute to the emotional dysregulation component of ODD. Let me put it another way. If you have ADHD, you already have a subclinical case of ODD. It may not arise to the level of being clinically diagnosable, and yet there is still a subliminal or subthreshold component of ODD that is part of ADHD, and that is because of the emotion dysregulation seen in ADHD. Now, we know that the emotion dysregulation in ODD arises from its association with ADHD, and we know that it is biological, not social. On the other hand, we also know that the social conflict dimension of ODD 
arises from a different source, and that is learning, and learning in particular within the family. Research indicates that some of the variation in the severity of ODD is due to disrupted parenting. This variation is seen in the social conflict symptoms of ADHD. So the emotion dysregulation seen in ODD is not learned. It is biological and it is being contributed by the overlap of ODD with ADHD. On the other hand, the variation in the social conflict symptoms of ODD is learned and it is most often learned in the family environment as a function of disrupted parenting. Now specifically, that disrupted parenting is a pattern of inconsistent, indiscriminate use of consequences within the family, as well as high rates of expressed emotions such as yelling and screaming and so on, and indeed vacillating between the use of harsh and lax consequences for uh, the individual's inappropriate behavior. So all of this is to say that parents who show disrupted parenting show a very inconsistent and indiscriminate use of consequences and of emotion. Now why would parenting be disrupted in this way? Because the parent often has adult ADHD. As you probably learned if you took my course on this website on the etiologies of ADHD, ADHD is a highly neurological and genetic disorder. Given that ADHD is highly inherited, it is quite likely that if a child has ADHD, that their parents are also likely to have the same disorder. And it is parental ADHD that is likely to be contributing to this pattern of indiscriminate, impulsive, and emotional parenting. And therefore, it increases the probability that the child will learn the social conflict component of ODD in addition to having the emotional dysregulation component of ADHD that also is part of ODD. Now we also know that disrupted parenting arises not just as a consequence of parental ADHD, but it can also occur as a consequence of other parental mental disorders, such as major depression, antisocial personality disorder, or ASP, and substance use disorders, or SUDS, as you see represented on this slide. So the emotional dysregulation component of ODD, which is arising from ADHD, predicts a different outcome by adolescence than does the social conflict component of ODD. The emotional component of ODD predicts the development of major depression and anxiety disorders. We know that both of these disorders are more likely to arise in children with ADHD over time. And we know that one of the predictors of the development of these disorders is whether or not the child has gone on to develop ODD. And now we know why ODD is the pathway on to later major depression and anxiety in cases of ADHD. It is the emotional dysregulation component of ADHD that is contributing to the risk for all three disorders. To the risk for ODD, and then later, the emotional dysregulation is contributing to risk for major depression and anxiety. So over time, emotional dysregulation predicts certain outcomes in ODD children, the emotional outcomes. The social conflict component of ODD, which is the more learned component, is predicting later in development the risk for conduct disorder. This is why it is helpful to think of ODD as a two-dimensional disorder. One dimension, the more biological component that is related to emotion and temperament, is contributed by ADHD. The second component, the social conflict component, is learned, and it is likely to contribute to different disorders over time, such as conduct disorder. So I hope you can see that by including emotion in ADHD, we have a much better understanding of why ADHD is often associated with the emergence of oppositional disorder, and we also have a better understanding of which component of oppositional disorder ADHD is causing. It's the emotion dysregulation component. But we can also understand that ADHD in the family may be contributing indirectly to the social conflict component of ODD, 
and that is because the parent's ADHD is contributing to disrupted parenting. Now here is a diagram that represents everything we've just described in a more visual form. What we have just described is that ODD, child defiance and social aggression, is here. And it arises from these two pathways. It arises from the biological pathway of dysregulation, dysregulated emotion that is part of ADHD and more generally negative childhood temperament and personality. So there is a biological component of the child that is contributing to the risk for ODD. But there is also a parenting component that contributes to ODD. And this is through disrupted parenting. But the disrupted parenting can only be understood if we back up further and examine why it is disrupted. And often that is due to parental psychopathology and also to significant family stressors that are occurring. Both of these are going to contribute to the risk that parenting will be disrupted and the disrupted parenting then contributes to training the child in the social conflict component of ODD. The child's own disorders are going to contribute to the emotional dysregulation component of ODD. So I hope this helps you to understand why ODD would arise in ADHD. ADHD is causing it. And I also hope that it helps you to understand why other emotional disorders may also arise in ADHD as a consequence of this emotional dysregulation component, and that is the risk for major depression and anxiety. Now, another reason to put emotion back into ADHD as a central feature of the disorder is that emotional impulsiveness and deficient emotional self-regulation will predict certain impairments in the life course of the individual beyond what would have been predicted by the traditional ADHD symptoms. Let me show you what I mean. Research has shown that the single best predictor of whether ADHD children will be rejected by other children when they enter a new peer group is not the traditional attention, inhibition, or hyperactive symptoms of ADHD. It is the emotional component of ADHD that is most strongly associated with social rejection. This is not only true in children, we have more recently identified the same difficulty in adults. So by putting emotion back into ADHD, we can immediately understand the social difficulties that ADHD poses for individuals. It is through emotional dysregulation that these social problems are most likely to arise. My colleagues and I have also shown in some of our publications that interpersonal hostility, as reflected on such scales as the Symptom Checklist 90, and also marital dissatisfaction and disharmony in adults with ADHD are best predicted by the emotional component of ADHD, not by the attention or inhibition components of ADHD. We have also shown that ADHD adults are likely to complain of parenting stress, and their parenting stress and family conflict is directly related to their own emotion dysregulation. But we have also shown that in parents who have ADHD children, their parenting stress as well is most strongly predicted by emotion dysregulation, not by inattention or impulsive hyperactive behavior. I've conducted studies in which we have controlled uh, or examined the contribution of emotion, inattention, and hyperactive impulsive behavior to the adverse driving outcomes associated with ADHD. For more on these driving risks, please take my course on the life course impairments associated with ADHD. Now, specifically, we have found that the emotional component of ADHD is predictive of road rage or the aggressive use of a motor vehicle, driving under the influence of alcohol, and to crash, ri crash risks while driving. Now, this is beyond any contribution made by the traditional symptoms of ADHD. We have also shown that the likelihood of being fired from a job and the likelihood of having interpersonal problems in the workplace 
are both more related to the emotional dimension of ADHD than to its hyperactive and inattentive dimensions. The inattention dimension of ADHD is related to the individual's ability to perform their work properly in the workplace, as reflected in work performance evaluations given by supervisors. But the likelihood of being fired from a job or of having conflicts in the workplace is related to emotional dysregulation in ADHD. We have also found evidence that dating relationships or even cohabiting relationships and the degree of conflict and dissatisfaction in these relationships is more a function of the emotional component of, OD, of ADHD, rather, as well as of ODD, of course, than of the traditional ADHD symptoms. And there is some evidence to suggest that the emotional element of ADHD is likely to contribute to violence within these relationships. More recently, we have studied the financial management difficulties associated with ADHD, which are numerous. And among these financial difficulties, those that were most predicted by the emotional component of ADHD were impulsive buying, exceeding one's credit limit, particularly on the use of a credit card, and therefore also in one's poor credit rating. Lastly, we found in our research that the extent to which a parent with ADHD had difficulties regulating their own emotions turned out to be predictive of the same problems in the offspring of these adults with ADHD, so that variation in the parent's emotional dysregulation was directly predictive of risk for variation in impulsive emotions in the children of these parents. And this also then went on to predict the likelihood that these children would develop oppositional defiant disorder. So what all of this means is that by putting emotion back into ADHD, we are able to predict impairments linked to ADHD that are not predicted by the traditional symptom dimensions included in ADHD, those of inattention and those of hyperactive and impulsive behavior. Finally, let's explore what it means for diagnosis and for treatment by putting emotion back into ADHD where it belongs. First of all, we know that the emotional adjustment of our patients over their life course is going to be in part now predicted not just by their core ADHD symptoms, but by the emotional dysregulation and the poor emotional self-control of our patients. That is to say that over the life course, the totality of an individual's emotional adjustment is in part being determined by some of the primary symptoms of ADHD, those having to do with emotion. But we also know, of course, that our emotional adjustment is going to be affected by the secondary consequences of ADHD, such as through failure in school, in work, and in family and peer relationships. Those repeated failures, as they rack up, are going to contribute their own emotional byproducts, such as demoralization and low self-esteem, to the clinical presentation of our patients. Now, in addition, as I have taught in my course on comorbidity on this website, ADHD is likely to be associated with other psychiatric disorders, some of which are mood and anxiety disorders, such as dysthymia, depression, anxiety, and bipolar disorder. These disorders will contribute in their own right to the emotional adjustment of our patients beyond the other two sources of influence I've just described. And then, of course, there is the contribution made by the other disorders that link up with ADHD that are not necessarily mood disorders, but that will have consequences across the life course as well, contributing to social stigma and failure in social relationships and difficulties in school and in the workplace. And these are disorders such as learning disabilities and the other externalizing disorders, oppositional disorder and conduct disorder not to mention substance use disorders that are also linked to conduct disorder. And then the other comorbidities we see in ADHD as well. And these will make their own contribution to emotional maladjustment. And finally, as we've already discussed, there is a contribution made by the social ecology around the child as they grow up, 
that contributes in its own way to emotional maladjustment. All of this is to say that if you want a complete picture of the emotional adjustment of an individual by adulthood that has grown up with ADHD, you must evaluate all five of these vectors of influence that are contributing to emotional maladjustment. But the point of this presentation is to draw your attention back to the con contribution made by ADHD itself, which has been ignored in analyses of emotional adjustment. ADHD creates emotional dysregulation, and that has a primary contribution to emotional maladjustment over the life course. Now, some further diagnostic and treatment implications of putting emotion in ADHD are as follows. First, it cautions us not to mistake the emotional difficulties of ADHD as representing a different disorder, a comorbidity, such as with a mood disorder. Emotional impulsiveness and difficulties with regulating emotion are part of ADHD itself. They are not due to comorbidity. And so there is no need to rush to diagnose a second or third disorder in order to account for the emotional difficulties that most of our ADHD patients have. It is simply a part of their ADHD itself. On the other hand, it also cautions us not to mistake certain mood disorders as arising from the impulsive emotion seen in ADHD. People with ADHD can have primary mood disorders in their own right, such as bipolar disorder, depression, and anxiety disorders. And these may not necessarily always arise from the emotional dysregulation in ADHD, but may arise in their own right as separate and primary disorders. In order to differentiate these primary disorders from ADHD and its emotion dysregulation, I think it helps to understand that ADHD causes a top-down dysregulation in the management of primary emotions. The emotions that the individual has in ADHD are rational. They are the same emotions that you would have in response to an emotionally provoked situation. But you would have inhibited that emotion and engaged in efforts to downregulate and moderate the emotion to make it more acceptable. That is the problem that people with ADHD have. So, if the emotional problems are due to ADHD, they're rational, they're understandable, other people would have felt those emotions also. But what separates the person with ADHD is that they express the emotion impulsively, and then they struggle to deal with the emotion in a socially acceptable way. Their emotions are not long-term moods. They are not excessive in the sense that they are irrational, extreme, unprovoked, and cannot be understood by reference to the provocative event. In contrast, a mood disorder is a bottom-up disorder in the self-regulation of emotion. The individual is creating moods and emotional states to an excessive degree, probably through overactivity and dysregulation within the limbic system itself and the amygdala. So that the individual is spewing excessive emotions, irrational emotions, emotions that are not necessarily provoked by a situation, or if provoked, are longer lasting and cross-situational in nature. So that in contrast to ADHD, this is not a problem with top-down regulation of normal emotion but a problem with the bottom-up expression of excessive emotions and moods across situations. To help differentiate the two, remember, in ADHD, the emotion is rational, understandable, and normal, but it is not being inhibited appropriately and moderated for its social acceptability. In a mood disorder, the emotion is not rational. It's extreme, it's labile, and capricious, and excessive. And it is not the result purely of an inability to regulate normal emotion. Now others, that is to say other disorders, may be an excessive enhancement of emotion as a result of difficulties in the, exe uh, the uh, executive system. 
For instance, we know that rumination as part of obsessive compulsive disorder can occur as a uh, result of OCD uh, and is sometimes seen in conjunction with ADHD, particularly if Tourette syndrome is also present. Obviously, individuals who ruminate can overexpress emotions, not because they have a difficulty in the emotion uh, control system, that is the limbic system, but because they are ruminating on a mental event and that is provoking the emotion associated with that mental event. So again, what is the difference between ADHD and other emotional and mood disorders? In ADHD, the emotion is rational, understandable, time-limited, setting-specific, reasonable, but it is not being regulated properly. Whereas in a mood disorder, or in a disorder in which the individual is ruminating, the emotion is excessive, irrational, long-term, like a mood, and inconsistent with the situation. So putting emotion back into ADHD can help us, I believe, with differential diagnosis of ADHD and its emotion dysregulation from the emotional problems created by mood disorders. Understand that these comorbid mood disorders may therefore require separate management from the management of ADHD itself. But if the emotional dysregulation is the only problem in the ADHD individual, then treating the ADHD will result automatically in improvements in the emotional dysregulation. So that putting emotion back into ADHD helps us to understand treatment of ADHD. For instance, as I've just said, if the problem the person has is with emotional impulsiveness and deficient emotional self-control that is part of their ADHD, then it will be improved by ADHD medications and it will be improved to the same degree that we see improvements in the inhibitory and in the inattentive or metacognitive dimension of ADHD. Indeed, studies show that the degree of improvement in emotion is directly correlated with the degree of improvement in the ADHD symptoms and that these are correlated with each other quite highly. As one improves, the other improves. Now, we also know that the different ADHD drugs are going to regulate the emotional problems in ADHD differently. For instance, research suggests that stimulant medications are likely to suppress the limbic system and therefore are suppressing the expression of primary emotions. This may explain why in some patients, particularly at high doses, emotions are blunted and the individual appears to have a limited range of emotion and often has the appearance that people describe as that of an automaton or being robot-like. Emotional expression, expression is being blunted by the stimulants because they are acting directly on the limbic system. Now that is certainly one way to control the emotional problems in ADHD, but since, as I've said, the emotional dysregulation in ADHD is not arising from the limbic system, but from the top-down management of that limbic system by the executive dorsolateral cortex, then it's possible that the stimulants are managing the emotion through an inappropriate pathway, so to speak. They're suppressing the expression of emotion rather than boosting the self-regulation of emotion. Nevertheless, the end result is that the emotional problems in ADHD are being improved by the medication. Now, in contrast, drugs like atomoxetine or Stratera do not have a primary effect on the limbic system. Instead, Stratera has effects on the anterior cingulate and on the dorsolateral cortex. And so it is likely that what Stratera is doing is boosting the executive regulation of emotion rather than suppressing the expression of primary emotions. That is why I believe that atomoxetine is not associated with blunted emotion or with a more robot-like or automaton uh, limitation in emotional expression, as can the stimulants in some cases. Finally, the new drug, guanfacine XR, called Intuniv in the marketplace, may be regulating emotion similar to that of Stratera, and that is by boosting the control of emotion 
through the anterior cingulate and especially through the dorsolateral cortex. So all of this is to say that the different ADHD drugs may be managing the impulsive emotions in ADHD through different routes within the brain. Keep this in mind as you come to understand the reactions that your ADHD patients may be having to the different medications that you're using and how they may be assisting them with control of the emotional component of their ADHD. Now, the secondary impairments that arise from deficient emotional self-regulation on major life activities may also be improved by ADHD medications. That is to say, for instance, that domains of impairment such as social rejection, interpersonal relationship problems as in marriage, dating, or cohabiting relationships, the emotional use of a motor vehicle that gives rise to road rage, the emotional use of credit cards and money as we saw in the financial domain of ADHD. All of these might be expected to improve as a result of the use of ADHD treatments such as ADHD medications because you're improving the contribution of the emotional element of ADHD to these major life activities. Now this also helps us to understand why ADHD treatments like ADHD medications also improve ODD. Indeed, research shows and has shown for more than 40 years that ADHD meds improve oppositional behavior as much as they improve ADHD behavior. And now we know why. By going back and understanding that ODD is a two-dimensional disorder and that one of those dimensions is emotional dysregulation, that is the anger, frustration, and hostility dimension of ODD, we were able to understand how ADHD is causing ODD. Well, now we can also understand how ADHD meds are improving ODD. They're doing it by improving the emotional dysregulation caused by ADHD. And therefore, they are lowering the frequency of the ODD symptoms themselves. But what the ADHD medications will not be able to address is the social conflict dimension of ODD. Because as I taught you earlier, that dimension of ODD is arising from social learning within the family and especially from disrupted parenting. And therefore, if you treat an individual who has ODD with an ADHD medication and there is still residual ODD after you have reduced their ADHD symptoms, then that residual ODD is probably what has been learned and one is going to have to enact a behavioral parent training program for this social learning component of ODD if one expects to improve that. Of course, this would also mean that one would need to screen parents of ODD children for their own ADHD and for other possible mental disorders because as I explained in the ODD segment of this course, there are parental disorders that contribute to disrupted parenting one of which is parental ADHD, and we would want to screen for that and treat the parent's ADHD before taking them through any behavioral parent training program. If you don't treat them, then they are unlikely to be responsive to the behavioral parent training program, and therefore their child's ODD, or at least the component that has been socially learned, is not likely to respond to the parent training program either. Finally, what this also shows is that there are some social ecological contributors to the development of emotional problems in individuals with ADHD that may require separate psychosocial interventions in addition to the ADHD medications. And they may also require relocation of the family to different neighborhoods uh, in order to help treat the comorbid disorder. For instance, we know that comorbid conduct disorder in individuals with ADHD is in part due to the uh, affiliation of this individual with deviant peers who are also antisocial, with living, living within uh, disrupted and disadvantaged neighborhoods where there may be greater amounts of crime taking place as well. Relocating the individual with conduct disorder to a different neighborhood, a more pro-social neighborhood, can have positive effects on the reduction in the comorbid disorder. All of this is to say that treatment of ADHD may require also treatment of the social ecology 
depending upon the comorbid disorders that coexist with ADHD. Now, by putting emotion back in ADHD, it also helps us to understand the individual's ability to use self-control in managing their emotional symptoms. This is a diagram that shows that emotional self-regulation, like all self-regulation, is a limited resource pool. We have only a certain amount of self-control, of self-discipline, of willpower, if you wish to call it that, of strength in our self-regulation. And this pool, this fuel tank of willpower, represented over on the left-hand side of this diagram that you see here by the yellow bars, this fuel tank of willpower can be diminished by using all of the executive abilities. And the longer the executive functions have to be deployed by an individual, the lower this fuel tank will become. That is, the less self-control an individual will have. And emotional self-control can deplete this fuel tank in its own right, in addition to all of the other executive functions. By the way, stress, alcohol, drug use, and other medical disorders can also deplete the fuel tank of willpower or self-regulation. So let's understand that when people with ADHD are put in demanding situations where they must self-regulate their emotions for long periods of time, it is going to deplete their willpower, their capacity for self-control. Ultimately, they run out of this fuel or of this willpower and they can no longer manage their emotions properly, which is to say that the next situation that comes along right after this depleting situation that may provoke their emotions is likely to lead to much greater difficulties in emotional self-control because they have little willpower or self-restraint left. Now, we can increase the fuel tank of emotional self-control, of willpower, by helping individuals with ADHD to engage in a variety of uh, activities that are known to replenish the willpower fuel tank. These replenishment activities are things like using greater rewards and helping individuals to engage in more positive emotions in situations that are emotionally provocative. We can also help them increase the fuel tank by helping them with self-statements of self-efficacy and encouragement. This is sort of like the locker room pep talk before going out and playing the big football game, the pep talk that a coach might give to team players. By helping individuals with ADHD engage in positive self-statements of their self-efficacy, of their ability to manage their emotions, you may be able to help increase their willpower to do so. In addition, we know that taking frequent breaks during emotionally demanding situations can help to replenish the fuel tank. I call it the 10 and 3 principle. 10 minutes of sustained work followed by 3 minutes of break from a demanding situation can help increase one's willpower and self-regulatory strength. Research also shows that simply taking 3 minute breaks from time to time for relaxation or for meditation can further contribute to replenishing one's self-regulatory resource pool or willpower. Visualizing our goals, talking about our goals, visualizing and talking about the future rewards that we will earn when we attain those goals, and doing this before and throughout a demanding situation can help to replenish the emotional fuel tank that is the willpower fuel tank that we use for controlling emotions. Finally, we know that routine physical exercise on a frequent, if not daily, basis also contributes to increasing our willpower and to expanding our capacity for self-regulation beyond that seen in individuals who do not exercise regularly. Finally, research shows that the self-regulation resource pool that is, the fuel tank of willpower is directly related to the level of glucose in the bloodstream in the brain. So that brain glucose is in fact the source of this self-regulation strength. And to the extent that that glucose is depleted, 
individuals will have difficulty with self-control generally and with emotional self-control specifically. This suggests that we may want to encourage people with ADHD to use glucose containing substances during demanding situations that place a heavy burden on their self-control and especially on their emotional self-control. For instance, keeping a sports drink nearby and consuming that sports drink frequently may help to keep blood glucose up and help to get more glucose into the brain and therefore help to keep one's resource pool for self-regulation topped up. We can help people with ADHD manage their emotions better by also going back to Gross's process model of emotion and seeing where one can intervene using cognitive behavioral therapy techniques to help diminish, minimize, or moderate the expression of emotion. Here again we see Gross's model of the automatic level of emotion. Now on top of this we're going to impose the cognitive or the executive level of emotional self-regulation. And we're going to see that there are five areas in which we could help people with emotional difficulties like ADHD better manage their emotions. For instance, we could help them with situation selection. By helping them to understand which, emotion, which situations are more likely to elicit strong emotions, we can encourage them to avoid these situations. For instance, if stopping off at a local bar after work for a drink uh, is a place where one is likely to encounter other individuals that one knows to be hostile to you and that this hostility is going to provoke emotional outbursts from you, then one needs to simply avoid this particular situation in the future and find a different place to have a drink after work. So that avoiding situations that provoke strong emotions is one means of helping people cope with emotional difficulties. Another cognitive behavioral therapy technique for helping people cope with emotions is that if they're in a situation that is likely to provoke a strong emotion, try to modify that situation in some way. For instance, sit in a different place or uh, have an individual sit next to you that you're friends with that can help you manage your own emotions. But alter the situation in some way so that it is less likely to provoke the strong emotion from you. For instance, if you're in a conference room with another individual uh, and you've been called into a meeting and you know that this individual provokes strong emotion from you, place yourself in a situation where you don't have to look at them and as I've said, sit next to another individual that may help you to better regulate your emotions, but modify the situation in some way. Another means of controlling your emotions is to divert your attention away from the emotionally provoc provocative situation. That is to distract yourself from the provocation. And in doing so, you can help to quell the primary emotion. You can do this by thinking of something else, looking away from the emotionally provocative person or event, or in other ways, diverting your attention. A fourth way of controlling emotions is to reevaluate the situation itself. This is a major cognitive behavioral therapy technique where the individual is asked to simply question whether or not the situation is as important as they're making it out to be. And by doing that, they can serve to uh, perhaps reappraise the situation, downregulate its importance for themselves, and therefore downregulate the emotion that is likely to be provoked by the situation. Cognitive reappraisal is a very common strategy in cognitive behavior therapy for helping people with emotional dysregulation to better manage their emotions. Finally, of course, there is the very simple means of simply trying to sit on and suppress the expression of the primary emotion itself so that one can put their hand over their mouth, sit on their hands, turn away from the situation, even leave the situation, and try to grit their teeth and hold back the emotion as well as they can. This is unlikely to be particularly useful for people with ADHD because of their difficulties with impulse control. But I mention it here because it is one of the five strategies mentioned in the gross model for managing emotion, emotional expressions. So to reiterate, there are five strategies 
for helping people with ADHD to better manage their emotions and their self-regulation of their emotions. Two of these strategies are proactive strategies. Situational avoidance and situation modification are ways of simply avoiding provoking the emotion entirely, and that's why I call them proactive strategies, as you see here. Now, I've already discussed much of what is on these slides, uh, and so let me move along rather quickly. We've also discussed the three reactive strategies that can be used for dealing with emotional situations. As we said, one of them is redeploying your attention or distracting yourself. Another is reappraising the situation, resulting in cognitive change about the importance of the situation, which then alters one's emotions in response to that situation. So talking to yourself, reasoning with yourself, using logic and evidence to help reappraise the situation can help to diminish its significance and therefore diminish the emotions it's provoking. And as I've already said, response modulation or modification can help uh, to manage the emotion. But these are three reactive strategies. Now I'd like you to understand that the earlier in the sequence uh, of emotion that the individual can intervene, the greater is the likelihood one can succeed in altering the emotion. That is to say that the reactive strategies I just showed you on the previous slide will be more effective than the reactive strategies that you see here. So again, the earlier in the stream of emotion one intervenes to head off the emotion, the greater is the likelihood one can succeed in doing so. So all of the strategies are effective in managing and controlling emotions, but they are not equally as effective. In conclusion, I hope I've shown you that emotional impulsiveness and deficient emotional self-regulation have been core features of ADHD since its beginning in the medical literature in 1798, and that for 170 years or more, emotion has been viewed as being a central aspect of ADHD. We know that the emotional impulsiveness in ADHD arises from the same disinhibition symptom list as do the hyperactive and other impulsive symptoms mentioned in DSM-4. And that is where we would place the impulsive primary emotions of ADHD. In other words, we are not asking that we create a whole new set of symptoms for ADHD. The symptoms of emotional excuse me, impulsiveness can simply be placed on the same symptom list along with the hyperactive impulsive symptoms. Such symptoms as impatience, low frustration tolerance, and quickness to anger would be good symptoms to include on the disinhibition symptom list in order to capture the emotional part of ADHD. Also, the deficient emotional self-control that arises from ADHD and its impaired executive functioning belong on the inattention symptom list, which we now know to be a list really of executive deficits associated with ADHD. And that is where the problem in the top-down regulation of the primary emotions would belong. Finally, I've shown you evidence as well that the neuroanatomy and the neuropsychology of ADHD indicate that emotional impulsiveness and poor self-control of emotion have to be a part of ADHD because the neural networks involved in ADHD are also the neural networks involved in the management of emotion. I've also shown you that there is substantial psychological evidence available in the literature that emotion is a part of ADHD and that people with ADHD have significant problems with emotional dysregulation. I also hope that I've shown you that by returning emotional impulsiveness or emotional dysregulation back into ADHD where it belongs, we can better understand some of the comorbid disorders that arise with ADHD as to why they arise and how ADHD treatments may affect them. And this is especially so for comorbidity with oppositional defiant disorder. I've also shown you that putting emotion into ADHD helps to explain many of the impairments that people with ADHD experience across the life course in major domains of life activities.
such as in their social relationships or impairment in managing their children and in parenting stress and in financial management and in driving and so on. The emotional symptoms of ADHD predict specific impairments in these domains that the traditional ADHD symptom dimensions simply do not. Lastly, I believe that recognizing that impulsive emotion and poor self-control of emotion are involved in ADHD can better improve our diagnostic and our treatment practices. Thank you for taking this course. I hope you have learned something about the importance of emotion in ADHD. I invite you to take other courses that I have prepared for you on this website with regard to ADHD, its understanding, diagnosis, and management. I also invite you to visit my publisher's website at guilford.com to learn more about my latest products in the ADHD marketplace, such as my three new adult rating scales for assessing ADHD, evaluating deficits in executive functioning, and assessing functional impairment in major life activities. Thank you again for taking this course.